The horns of this di uh, dilemma are split by observing a distinction between soft and hard necessary truths. A soft necessary truth is the free will of a free agent choosing to make the simple uh, contingent truths each true. So e each conjunct of the, con of the conjunction of all um, contingent truths truth one, then truth two, then truth three. Making those true was a free choice of a necessary being, let us say. So the existence of God is necessary, according to some theologians, but his free choices are not necessary. At the same time, they are not wholly contingent either, for they belong to a being, a deity, who necessarily exists. We define our conjunction in such a way, the conjunction of all contingent truths, as to exclude softly necessary truths. None of the objections to PSR, uh, hence, are very convincing. And this means that the Leibnizian and Kalam families of cosmological arguments go through. The third and final family of cosmological arguments are the Thomistic ones. The Thomistic cosmological argument observes that since the world as a whole is a contingent being, there must be a necessary being outside of our world, by definition, and all men call this latter being, the outside being that sustains the universe, all men call this being God. Notice that this sort of cosmological argument is happy with infinite regresses. If the universe was caused to be by x, and x was caused to be by y, and so on ad infinitum, we still need to have an uncaused first cause. The reason for this is that x, y, and so on are themselves contingent beings, and so the chain as a whole is a contingent being, or is contingent, and thus requires an outside necessary being, outside of the, the chain, the infinite regress. At this stage, the atheist is likely to bring up the fallacy of composition. However, the fallacy of composition is not a universal law. Every part of the Hershey bar is made of chocolate, and so the bar as a whole is made of chocolate. Uh, that's one counterexample uh, to the fallacy of composition, if viewed as, as an absolute universal law. Well, contingency, like the essence of chocolate, is the sort of thing, quote unquote, which does not have emergent properties. Hydrogen has the emergent property of wetness when combined with oxygen to make water. Two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen, H2O. But chocolate doesn't have the emergent property of non chocolatey goodness when combined with more chocolate. And contingency is the same way. Uh, now let, let's uh, come at this from a different angle. The universe is just the way that it is at this exact moment, and it could have been different. It could be exactly like it is, except there is one less grain of sand on one beach on the earth, uh, but otherwise identical to the actual universe just as it is now. Or we could all have two heads, one always happy and the other sad. And that's uh, from a recent episode, I think it's recent, of Family Guy about uh, the multiverse, that, that example. Uh, but if the universe were even a tiny bit different than it actually is, then it would not be exactly as it is at this very moment. In other words, the universe as a whole is manifestly contingent. It did not have to be exactly as it is. I could have one less grain of sand, uh, for example. But if the universe as a whole is contingent, as we've just seen, the fallacy of composition, uh, or no fallacy of composition, it, the universe, requires an outside necessary sustainer. If it could have been different, then it's contingent. If it's contingent, it requires an outside uh, sustainer. Now, even if the universe has always been here, since it is contingent, 
it requires an outside necessary being to ground it in being. This is a really hard argument to get around. If you really wanted to deny it, I suppose uh, you could say that the universe as a whole is not contingent. But this is unbelievably implausible. And what does not contingent mean? Uh, it means necessary. If you admit that the universe is a necessary being, then you admit the soundness of the modal ontological argument, and the atheist certainly wouldn't want to do that. With respect to the cosmological argument, to sum it all up, none of the traditional critiques are remotely persuasive and each, and each three forms of the cosmological argument uh, would seem to go through. Shalom out.